This, I know this was synced for Jordan's voice, but my voice can also be nice. Is that good? Awesome. All right. You don't want me doing that. I got one job, and it's not to sing. Praise God. How's everyone doing? Everyone good? Fantastic. Uh, well, my name is Derek Delane. I, uh, I serve as one of our pastors here at Proclamation Church. Uh, and from time to time, uh, things like that happen. Uh, but also, uh, we open up God's word. Right? We open up God's word, and we want to see what it says about all of life, uh, all areas of life. Uh, we are going through different series and things like that. Uh, we walk through uh, chunks of scripture. Um, and we do that uh, because we want you guys to understand that it's not our opinions, our thoughts uh, that matter. It's God's word that matters. And that's what we want to do. And so we spent the, the better part of a year and a half uh, walking through the book of Acts. And the reason why we decided to go through the book of Acts is because we truly believe that Proclamation Church and many churches uh, throughout uh, our nation and the world are is a continuation. They're continuations of what took place in the book of Acts. What I mean by that, people were coming to know Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit was moving. People were being saved. People were understanding what it meant to follow Jesus. They were being baptized, and churches were being planted. And because we are seeing people come to know Jesus, we are a church plant ourselves. We are a continuation of what took place in the book of Acts. And so we walked through that so that we would understand what it looks like to mirror what we saw, okay? Now, and let there be light. All things are happening today. Uh, now we're walking through the book of, of 1 Corinthians. And in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, in the same way that we said, yo, as we walk through Acts, we want to do what we saw in Acts. As we walk through 1 Corinthians, I'm here to let you know, we don't want to do what's taking place in 1 Corinthians. <laughs> 1 Corinthians is a church that uh, uh, people would be like, yo, don't model yourselves after. Uh, it's really messy. It's really gross. And in fact, um, as we walk through 1 Corinthians, what we're going to see uh, is Paul is writing to them to essentially give the church at 1 Corinthians a Holy Spirit spanking, okay? He, he, he's coming in hot with them because of a lot of things that they've done, right? And the reason why he's reaching out to them is because the culture around Corinth had so much impacted the church itself. Now, one of our values here at Proclamation Church is that we want to go to others because Christ came for us, right? And essentially what we're saying when we say that value is because Jesus came for us, because he saved us, we now have an opportunity to step back into culture, proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus to change the culture, to change our neighborhood, to change our city, to change our world. Because as followers of Jesus, that's what we're called to do. Well, what's taking place in Corinthians is the complete opposite. And family, if we're not careful, we could fall victim to the very same things that took place in 1 Corinthians. These individuals understood what it meant to follow Jesus, but at the same time, they were still marked by their desire to follow the ways of the culture at the time. This is why we're calling this series, as we walk through this book, Undivided, okay? Because we want people who are not divided on what we believe when it comes to Jesus and who he is. We must not be divided in our passions, in our desires, our way of life. If you are a follower of Jesus, you must strive through the power of the Holy Spirit to be undivided in your affections towards him. And that's what we want to see. This is what we see at the church at Corinth. The Corinthian Christians, at first glance, were very impressive. They were rich. They were well-dressed. They were knowledgeable. Their worship services were intense. They talked in strange, special languages that uh, the Bible calls tongues, which is what we're going to be looking at. Plus, they had some of the most famous leaders in early Christianity. Paul helped start the church. They had Peter himself come and hang out from time to time. Apollos, right? They had these great teachers as well. But they also wrestled with many of the very same things that we wrestle with. They had people in their church who struggled with substance abuse. They had all, all sorts of sexual behavior named among them. They had a lot of people who banked on grace. You know what I mean by that, banking on grace? That because you're following Jesus and you know that God is giving you grace for your sins, they essentially just like, dope, I'm going to bank on that and just do whatever the heck they wanted, right? That's, that's what they were doing. This is how they were living. They had people fighting over spiritual gifts. They, because they had all these different leaders come in, they was like, well, this leader is better than that leader. They would argue. There was division and disorder. This was the church at Corinth. And for the next several weeks, we are going to be learning from them. We'll be looking at this book for the next 12 weeks, and then we are going to take a break. We'll, we'll you know, kick around some other things, and then we'll jump back in uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, like we did with, with Acts as well. 
Now, as we kick off this series, I want to give us a refresher, okay? We spoke about the city of Corinth when we were walking through our Go and Proclaim series through the book of Acts. Uh, Corinth comes on a scene in Acts chapter 18 when Paul goes uh, into the city before uh, he plants this church. He spends about a year and a half there before he goes on to Ephesus. Now, what made Corinth different than any of the other cities that Paul went into is kind of what he said to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He says this, When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom, for I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. Why is that? We have to ask ourselves, why, unlike any other city, did Paul enter in with this type of anxiety, these type of things? Well, Corinth had a reputation about itself. To give you some background at this time, Corinth was one of the most prosperous and influential cities in Greece, even more so than Athens at the time. Where it was located is important to know as well because this is what made it so prosperous and and popular. It was a port city. Because it could be treacherous and somewhat dangerous uh, uh, of a bother to get around to the other side, Uh, sailors would port there at Corinth, and because it was only four miles from east to west, they would take all their their merchandise and their stuff, and they would uh, kind of trek through the city. And as they were trekking through, people were like, oh, I like that. Can I buy that? Can I buy that, right? And before you know it, it became super prosperous. Now, along the way, again, their cargo was purchased because this was a port city. Many people from all around the world, the known world at the time, would come to Corinth, right? And with them coming came business, And so the city itself was extremely diverse ethnically, socioeconomically as well, which made it extremely cosmopolitan. Now, we don't know how large it was exactly, but uh, uh, scholars estimated that it was around 40 to 60,000 people, right? Now, we hear that, we're like, oh, that's not that big. But during that time, that was huge. It was a metropolis, okay? Now, this city also prided itself on pleasures, both sexually and recreationally. Sexually, the city was so rampant in what they did sexually that when someone was found out that they were sleeping around, they would say, oh, you're acting like a Corinthian. <laughs> they, they gave it a, a, a name. Uh, Corinthicized is essentially what they were saying about it. At the top of the city was this, this hill to, uh, to the temple. Uh, on top of that hill was a temple for Aphrodite. This is the Greek goddess of love. Now, Aphrodite should sound familiar, right? This is where we get our terminology aphrodisiac, which essentially uh, is a sex stimulant, right? Well, At that temple, there was over a 1,000 prostitutes that every night would come down into the city, and essentially they would offer their bodies up to to worship uh, Aphrodite. In addition, there was the temple of Apollo in the city itself. Apollo, the god of music, song, and poetry, also the ideal of male beauty, platform of a specific physique and what physical fitness should look like, which speaks to the recreational pleasures of the city as well. Uh, second to the, uh, the Olympics, there was uh, this thing called the, the Ithsmian Games that was held in Corinth every two years, all right? Being fit and in shape was a big deal. In fact, Paul, later on in 1 Corinthians, he talks about the bodily exercise stuff. This is what he's talking about here, the crown that you get. This is what he's talking about here. He's referencing to the Cor- Corinthian people. Oh, you know this, right? You understand this, all right? Lastly, it was religiously pluralistic. Because so many cultures were coming into the city, they brought with them their different religions as well. So it was not uncommon to recognize the Greek gods, but to also see other religions and beliefs grab the attention of the people at Corinth. As we hear these things, it's easy to think, wow, this sounds just like every other American city. (laughs) Right? In fact, it sounds a lot like Nashville, if we're honest. Right? We're very prosperous economically, scientifically, politically. A lot of people are moving into our city. We're very cosmopolitan, meaning we're extremely multi-ethnic. We're multicultural people. Go to any park around the church. You hear different languages spoken, right? All corners of the globe are coming in. Different college campuses only add to that fact. We're religiously pluralistic. You can find not only one of many religions being practiced, but even religions and religious practices being brought in together in this thing called syncretism. You ever heard of syncretism? I'm a, I'm a Christian Buddhist, Right? Or you hear people saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm not very religious, but I'm, I'm very spiritual. You ever heard that before? This is, this is what we see here, right? Add to that, we're a very sexualized city. The hookup culture, the cohabitation practices that are so common among our, our peers, really even in the church, 
pornography simply being a thing you just indulge in just because. Like Corinth, we are a city. We love sex. And recreation, don't even get me started on that, guys. We live in a city where there's things to do. That, I love living here in Nashville. I really do. There's so many things to do, so many things to, to experience, right? You guys are like, you're looking at me. Do you enjoy living here? Come on, please engage me. This is, don't make this weird. You like doing stuff, right? We enjoy living here, right? The food scene here is amazing, right? Concerts on concerts. You can step outside of Nashville and go hiking and all these different things. There's a lot of things to do around here. Recre- I get that. Well, I got it, so chill. <laughs> Recreationally, there's just a lot of things to do, right? Add to that the, the, the physical fitness scene of Nashville, right? Working out and trying to have a specific physique, and we know that that speaks to uh, where we are as well because even when you don't look a certain way, that bothers you, right? This is just our city. We're obsessed with status and self-promotion. We got to market ourselves to improve our status, right? Be that a resume, what you post on Facebook or Instagram, right? Then we get on the idea of personal rights, like self-promotion and personal rights. We largely think of ourselves as individuals who should be allowed to pursue individual happiness as long as it doesn't hurt someone. And in the middle of that, we ourselves get to define what actually hurts someone and what doesn't, right? We, We hold ourselves high. Anything that impedes on us from our personal right to happiness, we consider unlawful or socially unacceptable. This was the city of Corinth. And this is where Paul came in and planted this church. Literally, right as he's sitting around and seeing all these temples and gods and all this stuff happening around him, Paul came in and said, yo, Jesus loves you. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He, he's lived the life that you couldn't live, die the death that you deserve to die. He rose from the grave. This is Jesus for you. And there are a group of people in Corinth that said, dope. Dope. I want that. Give me that. I, I want Jesus, right? And so this small congregation, this church began to be formed here, and, and Paul, for the next, uh, again, year and a half, essentially became their, these individuals' pastor, walked with them, discipled them before he left on to go to uh, Ephesus. While in Ephesus, we see that, that Chloe's people, says that we'll be looking at her, uh, that group, uh, a little bit next week, but Chloe's people were writing and going to Paul and was like, yo, the church at Corinth, the people that came to know Jesus, yo, they tripping. It's, it's wild in these Corinth streets. You got to say something to them, right? You got to say something to them. What we see is that the church at Corinth was greedy. They're selfish. In fact, their communion services were a mess, right? The way that, uh, the way that we do communion and the way that they did communion uh, back in the early church is a little bit different. Communion was more of like a, like a meal together in the early church, okay? And essentially what would happen is you would have people from all walks of life coming together, breaking bread over the meal and remembering Christ and who he was. What was taking place at Corinth, as we're going to see later on, is that the rich people were coming in and drinking up all the good wine, right, and leaving all the scraps for the poor people. They were getting super drunk, right? That's probably why they spoke in tongues so well out there, right? <laughs> they, were just, they were just really off the wall. And, and he's like, yo, that, like, that's, that's not okay. You're not supposed to do that. They were taking each other to court, taking away from each other rather than what we see in Acts chapter 2, giving to those who had needs, right? They weren't doing that here. The church at Corinth, they were beginning to have sex with each other. One person was having sex with his stepmom, we'll see. Paul shows us in this book that how we think about sex and sexuality matters and that how we think about it has to be countercultural. Just a little side note, that's why as we go through the series, when we get to this section, uh, I believe it's 1 Corinthians, uh, I think it's uh, 6, 7, and 8, uh, we're actually going to do like a mini-series inside the series. We're going to spend time actually just talking about sex and sexuality. And the reason why is because oftentimes this conversation of sex and sexuality, when we're confronted with it as, the, as, as individuals, we buck at it a little bit. Anytime scripture talks about it, we essentially want our individual happiness and the things that bring us pleasure. And so we have to be intentional with how we think about these conversations, right? So all that to say, all this is going on in the church here. Could you imagine their gathering, by the way? Right? This is a small gathering, right? So they had anywhere from 60 to uh, 75 to 100 people there at the church, right? Just a little bit smaller than, than us here at Proclamation Church, right? They only had one service instead of two, maybe, right? 
But here's the thing. They all knew each other. Everyone knew everyone. So what that meant is everyone knew who was getting drunk. <laughs> Everybody knew who was sleeping around. Everyone knew all these different things. Could you imagine their gatherings? Super awkward, right? And so Paul writes this letter, and his aim for the church at Corinth is to become a united witness of God's faithfulness to the culture around them. So today, what we're going to do, we, uh, Mackenzie, she read the introduction to Paul's letter, which, by the way, is the longest introduction that Paul has in any of his letters, okay? I want you to hold on to that. It's the longest one. And this week, as we walk through this, I want you, uh, sometime over the next uh, couple days, I want you to read 1 Corinthians yourself in your own personal time. I want you to wrap your mind around what we're about to get into, okay? Because I think it'll be very helpful for us. But we're going to read these first nine verses again. And the reason why I want us to read it again, because now I want you, with everything that we just spoke about, about the culture of Corinth and the things that were happening in the church there at Corinth, right? I want that in our mind as we now read verses one through nine again. Let's do that, okay? Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Sosthenes, our brother, to God's church at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called as saints, with all those in every place who call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of God's grace given to you in Christ Jesus, that by him you were enriched in everything, in all speech and all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, remember I said, this is the longest salutation, the longest greeting in all of Paul's letters. You notice, not a single command given. Not a single command given. Now, here's the thing. The rest of the book consists of one of the most vivid Holy Spirit spankings in all of Scripture. It's about to get nasty from, from verse 10 on, right? Some of the meanest things mentioned in the New Testament, Paul is about to lay out in 1 Corinthians. But in these nine verses, do you hear his tone? You catch it? Nothing but affirmation. Do you catch that? Nothing but aff affirmation. I want us to wrap our heads around something real quick, okay? I titled this sermon, uh, Pictures of, of Grace. This is why, all right? So when I, all right, we first moved to Nashville, I said to myself, yo, I need a hobby, okay? And so I decided to pick up photography, right? Now, if you know me, you know that that habit did not stick, right? <laughs> I still got my camera, and it's collecting great dust, but it wasn't, wasn't my thing, right? But for about, about three to five months, it was, I was immersed in that thing, right? I was trying to figure out, you know, the, the aperture and all that good stuff, right? Photographers in here, you know what I'm talking about? Maybe, maybe I just said that wrong. I don't know. Anyway, I was talking to Paris and, and Pastor Jordan and all these individuals who I knew were really great at photography and they were helping me out, right? So I had this app on my iPad that anytime I would hang out with my friends or my family, I'd bring my camera, I'd take pictures, I was able to upload it straight on my iPad. And later on that evening, I would just start editing pictures, right? And as I'm editing pictures, there's some that were super blurry. What did I do? Delete those, don't need those. There's some that just really weren't good or flattering to the person I was taking a picture of. So, you know, I would hold on to those to, you know, use it for their birthday to put on Instagram later, you know. Um, but there were some, I was just like, no, I don't, I don't need this picture at all. But the ones that I would edit, right, is I would try to get the right lighting and the shadows and all this stuff, the contrast, right, all those good things. And then I would post those, right, in hopes that people would like the, po like the, the post, right. And then they're liking the post. Here, here's the thing about a picture. A picture only grabs a moment, right? It doesn't really do a good job of letting you know the whole scope of what's happening in the, in the scene, right? Now, a photographer, that's their job to kind of try to put you in place there. But you know that individual is happy based off their smile. But what are they smiling about, really? You don't really know. You, you see that they out at the park, whatever the case may be. But what actually took place at the park? We don't know. A, a photo only gives us a glimpse. Why do I say that, right? What does photography and 1 Corinthians have to do? Why are they going together? Listen, I want us to understand something. Paul is frustrated with the church at Corinth. Don't, don't get it twisted. He's frustrated with them. They're taking each other to court. They're getting drunk during communion. They're all divided based off who's 
team pastor they're on, right? And then, you know, just calling names to the other people that aren't on their team, right? No doubt, Paul, like any other pastor, yo, I just gave you a year and a half of my life, and you out here doing what now? Be super frustrated, right? Yo, I, we just put your, you know, we, we recorded your testimony and, and put it on Instagram, and the same person who, you know, told their story and put it on Instagram is now sleeping with their stepmom? What? That's awkward. But what do we see here? Paul has a lot of reasons to be frustrated with this church based on the picture that's seen. But in spite of all that, Paul begins by reminding them of God's grace in their lives. Why? I would say it's because of this. Grace is given in a moment, but it takes a lifetime to play itself out as we navigate what it means to follow Jesus. I actually wrote it down because I thought it was good too. Grace is given in a moment, but it takes a lifetime to play itself out as we navigate what it means to follow Jesus. Guys, the older I get, the longer I've been following Jesus, the more aware I am of how sinful I am and just how much I need Jesus. Am I the only one? <laughs> Thank you. Broke, broke. We're messed up individuals. But I believe that Paul in this moment is patiently pastoring these individuals in these first nine verses. Don't get me wrong. He's going to go in on them. We're going to see that. But he has to first remind them who they are and what they have in Jesus. And I believe we all have to start there. We all do. The church at Corinth is a mess. The church has allowed the culture to influence it. The church has been putting on display this horrible testimony to a watching world. But this church, with all of its flaws, still belongs to God. Still belongs to God. What does Paul say in verse 2 after introducing himself and, and Sosthenes? What does he say? To the church of God at Corinth. To the church of God at Corinth. Why is, that, why is that so important? That's something for every single one of us to hold on to this morning. Because this is the thing. We know what this church is doing. Paul knows what they're doing. He's, he's been given this picture of what they're doing. But he's saying, you know what? This picture doesn't define all of who they are. This is who they are. They belong to God. They belong to God. Listen, that should be encouraging to us this morning because no matter what type of baggage we've come in with this morning, no matter what sin we've committed this week or what sin we committed last night, no matter your shortcomings, if you have professed faith in Jesus, family, guess what? You belong to God. That's who you are. Our need for grace speaks to the problem of our sin and the fact that we can't solve it ourselves. Nothing you can do on your own can cancel out the problem of your sin. This is what I mean by that. You can crush a million oranges. Guess what? You ain't never going to get apple juice. And you're like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> this, this is what I'm getting at with that. You can try and try and try. Behavioral modification, right? You can, you know, I don't curse as much as I used to anymore, right? I don't do the things I used to do anymore. I'm good. No. We need the grace of Jesus in our lives to save us. Behavioral modification ain't it. We need Jesus, and Paul is reminding them, and now us, who you are and who you have become because of Jesus Christ. In spite of their sin, Paul recognized that these individuals still belong to God. Why do they belong to God? Because of what takes place in the second part of verse 2. You've been sanctified in Christ Jesus. You have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, and you're called as saints with all those in every place who call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours. You want to know what's so interesting about that? He doesn't call them drunks. He doesn't call them greedy. He doesn't call them sexual deviants. He calls them saints. They belong to God because they've been set apart by Jesus and called saints. When Paul begins this letter, he realizes that God is a gracious God to those who, based on the picture given to him by Chloe's people, don't deserve it. 
and it pushes him to a posture of gratitude. That's why he says, I always thank my God for you. Like, guys, you're part of the saints. You, you know that? You, you're saint. You know that? Do, do you get that? That you, you can be anything else, but you're a saint. Write that down, Sosthenes. They're saints that we're writing here too. These are people who are part of the family of God. They're not outsiders. They're not less than, oh, I know what Chloe's people done told us, but it's who they are. Saints. <laughs> you may have heard me say this before. Fruit exposes the frauds. You ever, if you've been to proclamation for a length of time, you've heard me say that before. Essentially, the meaning behind that is you can tell if someone is a follower of Jesus based off their fruit, right? Man, after I'm reading these, these uh, verses, verses 1 through 9, the Holy Spirit punched me in the chest hard with this. Th this, is, this is what the Holy Spirit was saying to me, right? When we look at how Paul operates with these individuals, Holy Spirit's like, Derek, what if your posture changed from fruit exposes the frauds to lack of fruit gives God an opportunity to put his faithfulness on display to broken people. That we're so, so quick to cast people out based off the things that they've done and God has given people an opportunity, yo, come back. Come back. You operate in a system that ain't you no more. This is who you are, saint. Come live like one. This is who you are, righteous. Come be that. This is who you are, holy. Come on in. The water's great. This is who you are. Stop jumping back into the culture. The culture can't define you the way that I can, and I'm defining you as you are loved. This is who you are. This is why Paul is taking his time with the longest salutation in all of his books. I know what everyone else is trying to say about you, but I need you to realize this about yourself. I'm writing this to you because I want grace to recapture your heart all over again. That God is faithful to you. That's why he could say you aren't lacking in anything. You, you ain't missing out on nothing. You got the gifts. You've got the knowledge. And what is that? That's proof that Jesus has saved you. You've already seen that in your life. We just have to get to the fact that you can see that for yourself again. How does he communicate that? by focusing their attention on the one who's waiting for them. That's why he says in verse eight, he will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. He says, Jesus is going to strengthen you to the end. You will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus. Guys, when you read that line and have a full understanding of everything that they've been doing, you're like, Paul, have you lost your mind? Do you realize just how ratchet these individuals are? That God is going to keep them until the end? What Paul is saying is the church at Corinth is not a lost cause. He lands this plane not based on their moral performance, or the church, for the church, but completely on the faithfulness of God towards the church. That's why he says this in verse 9. God is faithful. It's as simple as that. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So what does that mean? Write this down. God is faithful even when we aren't. That's simply who he is. God's commitment to his people is a guarantee that the Corinthians, believe it or not, will actually make it. <laughs> Mind-blowing to me. In spite of everything that they've gotten wrong, in spite of their sin, even in that moment, Paul's like, you're going to make it. You're going to be all right. If that's true for them, then guess what, family? That's true for us today. God is faithful to us in spite of us. You know, the older I get, the more I'm convinced that the scandal of the gospel isn't who God keeps out of heaven, it's who he actually allows in heaven. <laughs> Bro, because if we honest, when we looking in the mirror, none of us belong. None of us do. I'm convinced that the throne room is going to be full of people in the first Corinthian church. Just like I'm convinced it's going to be full of people at Proclamation Church. Y'all better shout. 
We're broken individuals. And God in his grace is healing us. You notice, Paul doesn't begin by talking about the bad things in their lives. He easily could, and I don't think he's doing that to to butter them up a little bit, you know, to soften the blow. Because we're going to see Paul holds holding no punches at all in this book. He's not writing this letter to praise them for the things that they've done because we're already going to find out. They haven't really done anything great. <laughs> Paul writes to a lot of his other churches. He, he commends them on, you know, their hope and their, their love, right? Their faith. Not the Corinthian church. (laughs) But then he has the audacity in verse 4 to say, I always thank my God for you. (laughs) I thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. Can we be honest? That seems somewhat like a backhanded compliment, doesn't it? (laughs) I thank my God for you, not because of you, (laughs) but because of Jesus. So I got to be thankful for you, right? (laughs) No, that's not what he's saying here. I believe here at this point, Paul is honestly grateful for them even in the midst of the frustrations because he's forced to reckon with the idea that God is still a forgiven God, even to them. So it puts him face to face with God's grace all over again. If he's gracious to them, he's gracious to me. Bro, our God is a gracious God. I thank God for what's happening there because we're about to see God's grace on full display because of (laughs) y'all. You tripping? Praise God. Watch this grace happen. You messing up? Praise God. Watch this forgiveness come your way. Watch you get a whole nother opportunity to stand before the throne room of grace and receive it in your time of need. I'm ready for you to see that. All of that is given to you, not based off nothing you've done, clearly. This is the good news of the gospel family. God has included every single one of us as part of the family of God, not based on our merit, our skills, our abilities, or Bible knowledge. No, we are included based off the record of Jesus' righteousness on our behalf. That's it. So what does that mean for us in the midst of our Corinthian moments then? Well, I would say this, Jesus is not condemning us for our sin, but shaping us into the image of his son. God, excuse me, is not condemning us for our sin, but shaping us into the image of his son. He doesn't start with a list of things to do. He starts by calling us into something that he will eventually make us into. He calls us saints, holy. That's sheer grace. That's unearned favor to be included in the family of God. Even more astounding here is that Paul thanks God for the very things that are actually causing the church problems. When when he talks about the the gifts, right, we're going to see later on that they're abusing the gifts in a way. They're, They're speaking in tongues, and it's all disorder and messy, right? And he actually calls them out later on. But what's crazy is he actually used that as a sign to be like, but God has saved you. Because if he didn't, you wouldn't have the gifts to begin with. That's awesome. Knowing all the stuff that they do, guess what? God has still imparted to them gifts. Sign that the Holy Spirit is working and doing something in their lives, even in the midst of their mess. (laughs) I love that. Just look at all the passive verbs that he uses here, all of which they have. Grace was given to them by God, verse 4. They'd been made rich by God, verse 5. The testimony about Christ was confirmed among them by God, verse 6. They were called into fellowship with Christ, with Jesus Christ by God, verse 9. This is looking forward to the rebuke that he's going to give them in chapter 4, verse 7. He says this, who makes you superior? What do you have that you did not receive? Essentially what he's saying is like, bro, you ain't as good as you think you are. Any gifts that you got was given to you by God. Calm the heck down. Sit down somewhere is what he's going to tell them. Chill. You've been given these things because God has been gracious to you. But he needs to show them first that grace. He needs them to understand that first before he says, what the heck is wrong with you? (laughs) This morning, before we jump into the rest of the book, we might need to ask ourselves that same question. What the heck is wrong with us? 
Where have we forgotten God's grace in our lives? That we've taken it for granted. Have we forgotten the grace given to us by God through Jesus? Family, if you have forgotten, be reminded of this. I want you to notice the timestamps that he puts in these verses, verses 1 through 9. Ex- ex- expositionally here, right? He gives them something to look back on, to remember, something to expect in the present, and then something to wait on in the future. In the past that he's pointing them to remember, the Corinthians were given God's grace, verse 4. They were enriched in every way, verse 5, and they had the gospel confirmed among them, verse 6. In the present, they were amply supplied with the gifts of grace. They live in eager expectation of the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 7. In the future, they will be kept blameless on the day of Christ, verse 9. And they will be called into fellowship with Christ Jesus by God, verse 9. It is the assurance that in the cross of the resurrection that Jesus' work is finished on our behalf. Past, present, and future. In the future, they're secured. They're saved. They belong to God. And if you've placed your faith in Jesus, family, guess what? So are you. Plain and simple. We are not saved because we are brilliant or more righteous than other people, but because we were called and chosen by God. What was my part in the equation? The fact that I sinned. That's my part. Nobody wants to admit when they're wrong, though. Nobody likes that. We are so used to letting people down that oftentimes we are not open about about our shortcomings. The reason why we're not real and open about what's really going on in our lives is because we believe that people will repel away from us. But family, I'm here to tell you that God never repels away from us. In fact, when we're open and honest about our sins and our failures, that's when he's the most compelled to come after us, to secure us, to own us, to love us, to walk with us. That's what he does. We have to remember that. We have to confess our mess to God. We have to. He spends verse, nine verses saying, you're in the first class row now. Live like it. You, you've got first class benefits, family. Enjoy that thing. Live in it. Worship him because of it. There's an expectation now to operate in the things that you've been given, the benefits you've been given. Anyone ever been in first class before? Yeah, handful of you. Very first time I was uh, in a first class uh, flight, on a first class flight, uh, I didn't belong there. I'm going, I'm going to go and let you know now, right? So a buddy of mine, uh, uh, so we were traveling, doing some church stuff, and he flies all the time, and so he bought his flight, and he was like, yo, like, I'll buy my ticket on my name. You just reimburse me, right? It'll be good. And I was like, bet, right? So we, uh, I bought my flight. He bought our flights together, and on this particular flight, because of all his benefits and stuff, he got bumped up to first class, right? Because he normally rides first class, but because the common folk was riding with him this time around, <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. But he was, like, he was like, oh, you get bumped up, you know, Mr. McDaniel. So he's like, oh, Derek, you get bumped up too, right? My first time ever flying first class. It was awesome, right? We get in before everybody else, and, you know, the stewardess, she, she comes up. She's got the, the menu, and she's like, would you, would you care for something to drink? I said, from any of this. She's like, yeah. I said, I got to pay for it. <laughs> she's, like, she's like, no. I said, what? <laughs> so you know what I chose. I'm playing. I chose orange juice. <laughs> and it was nice and cold. It was fantastic, right? And I'm sipping it, you know, pinky out on that thing, right? Because I'm first class now. So I'm sipping my orange juice and, you know, the common folk walking by me. Right? And I'm, I'm making eye contact with them like, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? But here's the thing. Each time I looked at them, you know what? There was a piece of me that was like, I don't belong here. I belong in the back with the common folk. <laughs> I'm one of them, right? And Mike was like, no, bro, enjoy it. This is what it is. I was like, man, I hope I fly as much as you one day, Mike, because I want first class, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. The beautiful thing about that, I was able to ride first class riding on someone else's coattails. I didn't deserve to be there but I had an opportunity to enjoy all the benefits that came with it, right? Mike did all the paying. Mike had to do all the flying to to get all the stuff, right? 
I just enjoy the benefits. This is what it means to follow Jesus. <laughs> Plain and simple. Now, I know some of y'all have wrote, wrote first class before, but listen, for this illustration, you common folk, okay? <laughs> we have the opportunity to ride the coattails on everything that Jesus has done for us. He's paid the full price. He's looking at us and saying, yo, drink up. The orange juice is on me. <laughs> you got all the benefits here. Enjoy it. Live in it. You aren't common here. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. We're not common folk in Christ. Why do we sometimes want to live like it still? Why are we not enjoying the grace that's given to us, lavished on us, living in the freedom of what it means to be a part of the family of God? He's called us into a family. Enjoy the benefits. This is who we are. This is who the church of Corinth is. But it's going to get messy. But before it gets messy, we need to understand the grace. The snapshot, the picture of grace, that's ours. This is who we are. Amen, family? Let me pray. Father, there are people here who have forgotten the awe of who you are and what you've done for them that you need to restore the joy of their salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that you would do that, that you would allow them to see that you are still good, even when they doubt it, even when the actions that they're living in speak against it, that, Father, they can live in the fullness of life that you've given them through Jesus. Father, there are some in this room who have yet to taste and see that you are good, that the benefits that you give through Jesus, they haven't been able to enjoy yet. Father, I pray that they would understand what they must do to be saved. That they can acknowledge their sin, acknowledge your goodness through Jesus, and believe that goodness for themselves. And they can live in the newness of life that's offered to them through Christ. Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you remove the scales from their eyes, soften their hearts, so they can trust and believe that you are good, that they can be counted as the family of God. As your word said, if you considered, if you counted all of our sins, none of us would be able to stand. But with you, there is forgiveness of sins. And we have an opportunity to worship you because of that. So, Father, give us that chance. Give us that ability through the power of your Holy Spirit. Let us live in the freedom that you give. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Family, why don't you stand to your feet? As you're doing that, our prayer team is coming up. If you are a first-time guest here with us this morning, I want to uh, give a special welcome to you. I'm going to be hanging out here up front. Would love to get a chance to meet you. No pressure. I uh, just want to uh, say thank you for, for coming and checking us out uh, today. Uh, but for the rest of us, as we leave out of here today, let's leave out of here enjoying the benefits that we have, that we live in the light because of everything that Jesus has done for us. And now we have the opportunity through the power of the Holy Spirit to go and proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus to those who are still in the dark. And trust and believe that he's going to bring them into the marvelous light with us. So go out knowing that the Holy Spirit is already going ahead of you. You are loved. Family, go and proclaim. We'll see you next week.